My name is Adele, and I'm an alcoholic. Can everybody hear me? All right. First of all, I want to really and truly, from the bottom of my heart, I know what it is to be on committees. And I want to really and truly thank the committee for inviting me, a drunk, here to share with you this morning. You know, I think of the committee sitting there and I remember you have three or four, everybody introduces different ones and, and then there's a process of elimination and, and uh, then it comes down to one and they say, yeah, that's the one. And it doesn't matter what meeting it is at, but I know that this group that has put on this affair, this, this today, has worked real hard, you know. And I'm going to say this right now, and I don't want to hear anything more about it. <laughs> and if you have any gripes, get on the committee. <laughs> you see, because right now I can't find any gripes, you know. I'm living high off the hog today, I'll tell you. Wow, I got an air-conditioned bedroom. <laughs> yeah, and this room is air-conditioned, I remember. You know, well, there was a reason for us to move, and, and I, I like to bring this in because there's a lot of people say, why do we move? You know, I don't like changes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm getting a little older, and I don't like changes either. But I'll tell you, this spring, in order to make this change, to make it comfortable for Adele Donovan, the drunk, I came up and stayed overnight. And I said, hey, I kind of like this place. Now, I don't care where I am, and it wouldn't have made any difference if we'd have gone back to Farmington, and you know, as well as I do, me being me, I'd be right there. Because the whole reason for this get-together is the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I think sometimes some of us forget that. Well, I had to park my car four blocks away. <laughs> I remember when I walked four blocks for something. <laughs> Not just booze, either. Oh. <laughs> this is, oh, I, I shouldn't have said that. This is Sunday morning, right? <laughs> But sometimes Sunday morning, I didn't even know where I was, you know. <laughs> and I doubt that you did either. <laughs> because, you see, we're sitting here and we're all a bunch of drunks and we're all alike. <laughs> Some were on white carpets. Oh, I think that's wonderful. And I was on everybody's carpet. <laughs> but, you know, and anybody's booze... <laughs> But I want to, I really want to express this, and I want to thank this committee for inviting me here. And I want to thank them for the little basket that was in my room. And I went in that room Friday night, and there was a little basket of fruit. And, and I said, some, and some cheese. And I said, somebody's been in here. <laughs> well, you know, I wanted to look at it. If there was a man in my closet, I might have liked that. But... And they also said, you know, there was two red bands on my slip when I came in. And they said, somebody's going to be in the room with you. And, and they said, but we have no name. And I said, that's okay. You know, that's okay. <laughs> but I, I said, um, if it, it might be another girl that's in on the convention, and they'll give you the name later. Well, we'll find out. I said, if it's a man, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> now, I'm not dying for a man, you know. No way. I ain't taking care of nobody. <laughs> I've had my fill of that for many years. You guys would like a pad. Go look somewhere else. I suppose if it's God's will. <laughs> You know, I will be done. No, stop up.
this is a privilege to be here. And, you know, when, when Paul calls me, and I don't even know whether I said it or not, maybe I didn't, maybe I did, and I don't remember too good on many things. There's one thing I do remember is how I got drunk and how I got into this program, and I'm going to share that with you when the time comes. <laughs> but, you know, when he called me, I almost said, or I think I said, I'm not sure, he'd have to verify that, and he don't know anything, so he wouldn't be able to say anything anyway, because he keeps telling us he don't know anything. I almost said, you know, I've done this before. And then I, I believe, I don't think I did say it. Because, you know, when the telephone rings, as far as I'm concerned, it's God calling. And whatever's on the other side of that line, and whatever's the message on the other side of that line, I better accept it. I didn't come into this program to say no. You know, I didn't know how to say no when I come into this program. It was, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'll be glad to do that for you. <laughs> Hate the son of a gun for doing it, but I'll do it for you. You know, so when I come into this program, I, d I don't believe I did say it, but I had it right. Uh, it, I've spoken at the roundup before, then I didn't say anything. Because uh, I'll tell you how that happened. I was at the Portland group, and um, there was a meeting, and... Someone asked me to speak. The chairperson said, Gal, would you like to say a few words? And I said, yeah, how long have we got? And uh, I spoke. And then the following week, we had a new chairperson. And the chairperson said to me, Gal, would you like to have you say a few words for me? And I said, well, I spoke last week on Sunday night on my home group at that time. And he said, yeah, but I wasn't here. You don't have to think about that. You think about that. That was his choice. They told us that we have choices in this program. And that was his choice. So I said, I'm sorry. Yes, I will say a few words. And I remembered that. So I try not to refuse. Because maybe somebody else hasn't heard me. And we have a lot of people in here that are, are newcomers. And I mustn't forget that. I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to share myself with you. For the newcomers. The old timers too. But the newcomers. I don't know how deep to get into my story. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a step girl, and I, I'm working now in the big book, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. God put me in Skowhegan. I moved from Portland. I lived in Portland for 47 years, and I moved a year, and, a year ago last May to Skowhegan with my, own, my choice of move. Sold my business, my ceramics, and I chose to move to Skowhegan to be on my son's land. I bought a, a new mobile home, and I am very comfortable, and I love it there. But I am by myself. I do my own thing. I'm, I don't live in with family, and I love them dearly. This is a miracle. What I'm doing today is a miracle. Not only with my sobriety, but it's a miracle that I'm with my son. And... uh this change has been a big, big change with me. As a matter of fact, uh, I, joined, I joined a meeting, and it was a meeting, and we made it into a group because I was floundering. I, I didn't have a group, and I was always used to being in a group. Uh, the Portland group was my group. I hated them sometimes, you know. They wouldn't do what I wanted them to do. And uh, I balked, and I didn't like them, and I was going to quit them. I'm quitting them. And so for two months, I quit them. I wanted my way, and they weren't going to give it to me. And those old timers, I'm telling you, there there were really something. And we heard some stories last year about old time last night about old timers. And you know, the program. I'm going to have to say it. I don't like to, but it was different. You did as you were told. You didn't fool around. I would go to the meeting and I'd be having my heart was up in here and I wanted to cry and I'd say, don't cry. Well, you know, when somebody tells you not to cry and it's up here, you want to really cry, you know. They told me to sit down and shut up. Now, they didn't get up here at the microphone and tell me. Yes, they did. But they... <laughs> yes, they did. But, you know, it was like on a... Like I could hear what they were saying 
And I was very dense, and I was a very sick girl. But they would say, sit down and shut up, and maybe I can get some of this program. And, you know, I was sitting right there. <laughs> they put me down front. I was all by myself. And there was only about 7 to 14 people there, and they were all men. Now, I wasn't afraid of men. No way. <laughs> I was not afraid of men. I was not afraid of women either. I was just afraid of a gal. When I came into this program, broken, sad, full of resentment, full of anger, you know, we forget. We like to complain about this and that and the other thing, but we forget. We came in here many, many, many. I didn't come in here broke. I was lucky. I had a husband. I didn't lose my house. I didn't lose my car. I lost my dignity. I lost my faith. I lost hope. But you see, we forget. And I'm up here to remind you that you're not to forget. This is Alcoholics Anonymous, and you have been given a chance to live. Why complain? I came into this program, I had no choices. I knew nothing about a program being formed. I knew nothing of that. I knew nothing of people being together around a table that was staying sober. I didn't know what Alcoholics Anonymous meant. As a matter of fact, I didn't really know what an alcoholic was. Now, I like to call myself a drunk. Because nine times out of ten, you all know you got drunk. But you didn't get alcoholic. <laughs> you know, and I couldn't understand that. My head was so thick, you know. I was told once I had scrambled eggs between my ears. And I didn't like that person. No way. They don't know who they're talking to. <laughs> but I was so sick. I didn't know I was that sick. I should have been hospitalized, and I was too frightened to go to Milestone, where they had offered me to go, and they would have had a doctor take care of me. And as soon as they said, doctor, I said, no. No way. I'm scared. And we all came in here that way. I don't care if you were pushed in by your doctor or who you were pushed in here by. The feelings that are deep down inside are what pushed you in here. You were alone. We were frightened. We were sick. And we didn't even know it. I didn't know that I didn't know. Such a statement. I knew something was wrong. I wanted to stop drinking, and I couldn't. The beautiful phrase, I'm going to stop tomorrow. I'm not going to drink tomorrow. Jack wants me to go to the First National, and I ain't going to drink. You know, Jack was always telling me what to do. That was my husband, by the way. I hated him with a passion. I'd have killed him, but I might have had to go to jail. It was his fault. Now, if I could get rid of him, I'd be all right. How many of us have said that? I'm glad to see you putting your hands up. You know, I, I called step the girl, I'm going to go off it a little bit, I called step the girl a long time ago. I've been in here a long time, I've been awful busy. And you know, they called me up and I was always on that line service and I was everywhere. And they called me up and they said, I'm not going to, I would just say Gertrude, I don't even remember her name, God bless her. I don't know where she is even. But they said she's in jail. I said, really? They said, you, they asked if you would come down to see her. You're her sponsor. I said, I am? 
Well, I had been playing around and working around with her, you know, and I went down. And, but before she went to jail now, before she went to jail, she said, I can't stay sober because my husband drinks. Oh, he does? I said, so is mine. When I'm staying sober. Well, she said, if I didn't have him, you know, I'd be all right. And many of my girls have heard this story before, but they're going to hear it again. Because I went down to jail and I, you know, her husband died. Her husband really died about a year. I didn't know that. So I went down to the jail and I saw her and I said, how are you doing? She said, you know, Jim died. Said, no kidding. He did? Yeah. I said, what the hell are you in here for? She said, because I've been drinking. I said, you told me if he died, you'd stop drinking. See you later. <laughs> Nothing I can do. I ain't going to die for it. No way. I'm too busy, 12-stepping all over the city of Portland. I said, when you get out of here, call me up and we'll go to the meetings. Yeah? But you see, she said, if he died, I could stop drinking. I said the same thing. If he got out of my life, I'd stop drinking. I couldn't stop drinking. I'm an alcoholic. And I have a disease. Oh, I got a, I got a disease called alcoholism. Isn't that great? I'm a drunk. And if I pick up a drink, I'm going to get drunk. And I believe everything that's said in the big book, and I go along with it, and I've listened to it for many, many years. And I, but I do know that I'm the drunk, and I must remember that I can't even pick up a thimble full of whiskey because it will send me off. And who knows when I would ever come back. You don't know. I don't know. The God of my understanding would know. I may never get a chance to be sober and to enjoy this life that I'm living. I came into this program in 1970, in the dead of winter, January 28th. Cold, snow, it, there was no women. I thought I was the only woman in the city of Portland that was a drunk. And I knew better because I had drank with many of them. <laughs> I was a waitress for 23 years. And I knew some of them were at the bar. And, of course, naturally, when I was six, seven months sober, I was going to go to the bar and get them. You know how we are? Oh, jeez, i got to get my friend, and i got to get this one and that one. I came in here like a puppy dog with my tail between my legs. I had no place to go. I didn't know anything about staying sober. And that happens to be the God's honest truth. Every day, I snap that can of beer open, and I put the whiskey in it, and I had whiskey on the side, and every day, I'm not going to drink tomorrow, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you it was 35 day, years and 22 days and 18 hours. I don't know when I turned out to be an alcoholic. All I know is I drank, and I loved it. I loved the flavor. Wow! I loved what it did to me. It made me happy. And I was a party girl. <laughs> oh, we're partying tonight, boy. Come on, Jack. Put your best on. Let's go. And if he said he didn't want to, I'd go out and get the party and bring it home. <laughs> Wake him up at 2 o'clock in the morning after I'd been to the bar after working and bringing a gang of 14 or 15 people home. Booze. Booze. He'd get up there. What are you doing? We're having a party. <laughs> okay. And he sat and drank right with us. He and I drank together for a good many years. And Jack never stopped drinking, and that was his prerogative, right? You know, but I stayed sober. I said, people, places, and things do not make us a drink. I heard a gentleman up here last night. I don't know where he is, but it's, it may be. I don't know, but he said, 
he drank because he drank. My mother had nothing to do with it. And my father. Of course, I blamed him. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> had to blame somebody. But when I got into this program, they said, Del, you're the one that kicked your elbow. Oh, I had a good time. And you know, you open your refrigerator door, they said, and you pour a glass of juice or a glass of water and set it on top of your refrigerator. Because your elbow has been so used to going up and down, you've got to have something to help it go. So I would open the refrigerator door, did exactly as I was told. I didn't know what the hell I was doing this for. I could have put it on the counter. No, 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 I had it in the refrigerator because they said, because you open the refrigerator, you get the beer. I said, oh, yeah, that's right. So you open the refrigerator, there was my glass, I take a drink, put it back, shut the refrigerator door, I kept my elbow moving. I said, we, we don't care what you drink, just don't drink liquor, and don't drink any beer, and stay the hell away from the wine. I said, I don't like wine. I said, well, stay away from it anyway. <laughs> and you don't drink Echo Velva, you know, and you don't drink all of these things. And what's that, NyQuil? I always had a cold. <laughs> you know, my eyes were so bloodshot, I never saw what well it read on it. Do you think I was going to read boxes? Not me. <laughs> they said this was good for me. You know, and this is what was happening with me. I come in here well beaten. I drank for a good many years, and I was 45 years old when I came into this program, and God was with me, you know. He is with we drunks, whether you believe in a higher power or you don't. Believe that I believe because I see, I see him in your eyes. I don't care if you're sober one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, I don't care. It's just that I see that in your eyes. God is with us. I had been drinking for a good many years, and I was 45 years old when I came into the program, and I was covered with sores. My whole mouth was covered with sores, and my eyes were slit. I couldn't see. I couldn't walk well. And I couldn't talk. Can you imagine this? I couldn't talk. I couldn't make a sentence. And I couldn't eat. And I slept. But, of course, I'm talking to another drunk now. I was passed out. I didn't sleep. Spiritually, I was broken, broken with nothing. Mentally, I was confused with all the negative feelings. And physically, I was a wreck. And you guys invited me back. I can't. That blows my mind. You said, come back, Adele. And I was so ashamed of all of the sores on my face. And the sores, I'm going to tell you, is because I drank straight whiskey. And it burnt my gullet. i got a deep voice now. But when I come into the program, it sounded just like a man. It burnt my gullet. I didn't know. And, of course, the first thing I said to you was, I have cold sores, and they're awful sore. And you said, yeah, we know. You know it was booze sores. And I couldn't smile. And you know when you have a cold in the wintertime and you've got a sore and you go to smile and it cracks and you go, oh, you put some salve on it just to keep it, I was putting salve on it. Keep it smooth, you know. 
you knew. I wasn't fooling the drunk that was standing in front of me. So if you think you're going to fool me, you ain't. I've been there. That's a drunk talking to another drunk. And they said, we no doubt. You keep coming back. And you there's know, that forever pat on the shoulder. You're doing a good job. What the hell was I doing? I was like this. <laughs> I'm doing a good job, yeah. Should have been hospitalized. My sponsor, whose name was Cookie, and he's dead today, and a lot of the people way back there are dead today, took me to my first meeting. He came and saw me on a Friday morning, and he says, I'm going to take you to your first meeting Sunday night. Do you think you cannot drink until Sunday night? And I said, I'll do anything. He said, I'll come and pick you up, and I'll take you to your meeting. There's a meeting at, at Cape Elizabeth tonight, but I don't want to take you there because... The first meeting that you go to, you get an impression of that meeting, and you feel like you want to be there. And he says, you're a member, you'll be a member of the Portland group because you live in Portland. And I said, it's okay with me. He said, do you think you can go to meetings? I said, yeah. I never said, how many am I going to go to? <laughs> I had questions, but not those kind. Now, i got to remember, I'm the one that asked for help. He didn't come there on his own. He didn't even know I existed. Until he got the telephone call that a girl by the name of Adele Donovan on Park Avenue was sick as a dog. And needed some help. So he came back Friday noon, and I was like this. And, you know, if you haven't been like this, you know, I'm, I'm going to invite you to drink, and you will be. You know? <laughs> you say, oh, that didn't happen to me, oh, yeah? Well, you go out and drink and it will. My promises. I'll write them all down. They're not in the big book either. <laughs> so he took me to my first meeting, and there was about eight men there. The hall was about as half as big as this hall. Damn big hall. They were all sitting up there. And they put me down here. <laughs> and I'm all alone. I'm in the third row, the fourth seat in, all by myself. And Cookie goes over and gets me a cup of coffee. And he filled it half full. And he knew I was a drunk. Oh, first of all, he, he came on Friday noon. He said, did you drink? And I said, no. You told me not to. And I'm going like this. And he said, you know, I got a Valium. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, he said, it'll kind of quiet your nerves. But he says, you know, you can get addicted. Oh, shit. I said, I don't want that. I got enough. He said, I got a drink in the car. I said, I got a drink in the house. But you see, I'm going to tell you, 25 years ago, you know, you, before you get the drunk to the to the 24-hour club, we're talking about, he gave him a drink. And I can understand that today. But I used to say, why did they give him a drink? They gave him a drink to get him there. Oh, I did that. <laughs> yeah. You want a drink, honey? Yeah. Okay. You have a drink. You really mean I can have a drink? And I'm going to Crossroads? Oh, yeah. Because once you get to the crossroads, you don't have any more. <laughs> I knew that. They didn't know that, but I knew that. And he offered me a drink. I said, oh, God, I got a drink right here in the house. I don't want a drink. He said, I forgot to bring you the literature. You see, I found out later, though. But see, I didn't know that. I found out later, he didn't give me the literature because he'd come back to check on me. That's what you call compassion. Huh? He didn't forget little Adele up there on Park Avenue. He come back and he gave me some papers. And he says, I'm going to pick you up now. Remember, I'm going to pick you up Sunday night. I'm going to take you to the meeting. And he did. And I was a member of that, that group until I left there a year ago. Whether I liked him or not. 
One girl said, you don't like the group? No. She said, what is it about the group you don't like? I said, I don't like the people in it. <laughs> well, she said, what are they doing to you? I said, they're bothering me. <laughs> well, what if, what if there was no people there? What would you do? I said, I'd be alone. She said, do you want to be alone? I said, no. You better go back to the group. <laughs> she was right. She was right. I was now taking everybody's inventory, having a ball with it. So I took them to my first meeting, and I'll be forever grateful for that. And that man drank after 16 years of sobriety. I don't know how many years he had when I came in, but, well, anyway. Uh, three years later, I think it was three years later, I told step my sponsor. He said, how the hell did you get here? I walked into his room. His mother, I had met, his mother was beautiful. Mother-in-law was beautiful. And she said, he's in there. He's right in there. <laughs> Cookie, what the hell are you doing? Who the hell let you in here? I don't know, but I'm here. You want to go to a meeting? No. Well, and I talked to him the same way he talked to me. That man died sober. He was on his way to a meeting, going from the 24-hour club up to Congress Street, and he died on, on the sidewalk. What a way to go. Right in God's hands. So beautiful. You know, that's really tre precious to me stay in the program you see a lot of stuff so I went to these meetings and I listened I couldn't read and one of the gentlemen kept saying if you don't read the big book you'll never stay sober well I'm going to tell you something kids if you don't read don't worry about it because here's a I'm going to say illiterate <laughs> I know how to read but I couldn't read who the hell can read when my eyes were crossed and bloodshot and and I said, if I don't read that big book, I'm going to die because he said that. And I believed everything everybody said that got up here. I heard their stories so well I could tell you each one of them's stories. And they said, when you get tired of hearing somebody's story, get up and tell your own. I said, oh, no, I don't want to get up there. And they said, well, then shut up. <laughs> I say, oh, is that him again going to say that? Oh, there's only about eight guys. I mean, you know, we've got a new speak a meeting, what are you going to do? And they told me I had to keep shut up, keep my mouth quiet for 30, for 90 days, three months. Pretty soon, Henry Lydon, he's passed away. He came up to me and he said, Dal, you want to speak? She's almost fell out of the chair. I said, no. No. I was about a month and a half sober. And I said, they said three months? I whispered to him, did you know they said three months? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I know that. But he says, you want to know something? And he came right down close to me and he said, there's a lot of firsts in this program. First, you had to make a decision to come to the program. Then you had to make a decision to come each week to each meeting. And now you've got to make a decision whether you're going to speak and share or not. And he walked away and left me. I said, gee, got my coffee and here I am. I start to shake all over again. <laughs> and I said, these guys have been so good to me. I, I really shouldn't say no. These guys have really been good to me. So pretty soon Jimmy goes by. I said, Jimmy, he said, what is it? I said, I'll say a few words about like that. He said, wonderful, wonderful. He walks off. <laughs> I got up and I said, my name is Adele and I'm an alcoholic and I'm very nervous and I drank for so long and I don't know how, I don't know, I guess I better sit down. <laughs> I did it. They were sorry for that. <laughs> There's nothing a drunk likes to do but share. <laughs> so you want to say a few words, how many? <laughs> I 
And you know, there's a woman that was in this program that came in. They came in during the month of March, I think, February. I think everybody got cleaned out of snow. And I was going to I was going to the meetings in a truck and didn't have any. Well, I was I was also a, a contractor. You know, you guys. I was a contractor. I drove truck and I plowed snow. <laughs> You think that's funny? I could have killed him for teaching me to do that. <laughs> I mowed gardens, mowed lawns, and did all of these things, you know. I almost put a truck up for sale, but I didn't dare to. But I'll tell you one thing I did do. I put I put the snowblower up for sale. For three years, drunk as could be, I plowed snow. I shot I, with a snowblower up on the western promenade. I said, these sons of guns are going to get out and shovel their own damn snow. I'm sick and tired of doing it. Because I was drunk. I was sitting. I had men working for me. I was sitting in the banking. I was drunk. Drank the night before. You know it doesn't go off here. So I took the lawnmowers in the summertime and I put them up for sale. I told Jax, I want to sell those lawnmowers in the summertime. You can't do that. You know that. And the jaw. Oh, the jaw was great big. He put a, he put a, he put a, uh, on the tire there. What do you put on in the winter time? Chain. Put a chain on it. Well, because it wasn't, I had to work it so hard to put a chain on it. Whoa, what, what pretty good. Put him up and sold him. <laughs> he come home and I said, sold everything. He said, sold everything? Are you crazy or something? Yeah. I ain't working no more like that. But I forgot where I was at, but it doesn't matter. I listened in this program, and I wanted this program. And he drank. And this girl, Mary, that's what I was going to say, Mary Kay, she has 44 years of sobriety today. She picked me up as sponsoring, and I knew nothing of a sponsor. And she said to me, she says, I want you to go to a retreat. And I said, What's a retreat? And she said, well, don't you worry yourself about it. She said, have you got $25? I said, yeah. She said, well, I'm going to come and pick you up, and we're going to go to a retreat in Vesta. Now, don't you worry a bit about it, and we're going to just have a nice time, and we're going to go learn about about God. Well, I wasn't too keen, thinking, you know, I was new. And they had the banner, but for the grace of God, in front of me, and the first thing I said is, oh, shit. You know, I got to go to confession. They're going to put me in the middle of the room, and they're going to say you. And they know they didn't do that, but I was waiting for it. So I went home and I said to Jack, I said, "I'm going to a retreat." He said, "What's a retreat?" I said, "I don't know." He says, "You don't know?" I said, "No." I said, "All I know is I got to have twenty-five dollars. Give me twenty-five dollars." I'm going to a retreat. So where are you going? I don't know. She had said a gaffer I couldn't remember. I was sick, you know. I want you to know that. And so she comes and picks me up and takes me to the retreat. I go to the retreat, and it's the first time I, I may have heard that I went to a retreat in April, April 16th. I'll never forget it. And I learned that God loved me unconditionally. And I'm here this morning, this is a spiritual program, and I'm here this morning to tell you that God loves you unconditionally. He doesn't care what you did, and he doesn't care who you did it to. He doesn't care what you said. He doesn't care what you, who you said it to. He just loves us so much. You know, Father, uh, that, not Father Martin, Father, Father Martin, you know, has, had a wonderful film, I think I saw about five times, and he said, and he said, the statistics to Alcoholics Anonymous are, one out of 36 are chosen. Can you imagine that you are one out of 36, each one of you? And you know, that puts such a thing on me. And I said, God chose me for what? To stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And you know, that meant a lot to me. 
And he taught me about the Lord's Prayer. And on that same weekend, they de- they took the Serenity Prayer, put it to- took it apart, and put it back together. And I-, I didn't understand these things. You know, I had to write down the Serenity Prayer. I couldn't remember. I'd seen it in our- other people's homes, and I'd say, "Isn't that beautiful?" I never knowing that one day I was going to live by that Serenity Prayer. And they took the Lord's Prayer and they took it apart. They stretched it and pulled it and tugged it and then they put it all back together and they made a Del Donovan understand what the Lord's Prayer is about. And there's so much meat in there. There's so much, so much spirituality that enters into you. You know, we say, for thine is the power. You know, God gives us so much power. If you stop and think how much power he gave you to be here this morning. <laughs> You just look at yourself. I was up in that room and I was thinking, wow, I'm one of the chosen. And he gave me the power to be dressed and to be clean and to be happy and to look in the mirror and say, Adele, I love you. I can do that today. And the glory, he says, oh, it gives me the glory, the joy and the peace and the happiness. We were all looking for what I was talking about a few minutes ago. Sadness. The hate. We didn't know the difference. So I sat at these meetings and I went to these retreats. I went to retreats for eight years. And I went to 16 retreats because, oh, and I started one. I went to 16 retreats twice a year I went. So that I could learn what the 12 suggested steps had to do with God and me. And you? And it was the best thing I ever did for myself. Because I remember that there was a gentleman, he's passed away today, and he used to get up here and he said, well, if we talk too much about God, we're going to send the, the drunk away. How can you say the serenity prayer without saying God? Now, you, you, you know a way, you tell me about it afterward. I'll talk with you after. I don't know how to do that. I have power. It takes a long time for us to keep coming back to meetings and they keep saying, keep coming back, keep coming back. And they want us to learn and they want us to learn. And You know, Eddie G got up here last night and uh, it, it was so cute because I, I just love Eddie G. I don't, I don't know if he's here this morning, but I love Eddie G. And he gave me my white chip and he reminds me every time he sees me. I gave you a white chip, you know. I, I, don't know. I, I know. Yeah. He says, sign your name right here. He says, what, what's your name? And I, what's your middle name? And I said, Blanche. He said, well, you can put Blanche right here because this is an, an anonymous program. I don't know what the hell that word was. It didn't make no difference to me. I said, well, everybody in Portland knows I'm a drunk. So I wrote, Adele Blanche Chase Donovan right across the book. And he gave me my white chip and I'd be so ever grateful. And he told me that if I drank, I had to break it. Oh, God, don't tell a drunk that he's got to break something. You know, and I, I, I didn't have a pocket like you guys do, but it was on my counter. And he said, if you break, if you have a drink, you break it and you bring it back. Can you imagine bringing a broken chip back to the group? No way. I needed a drink, but I'm going to drink because i got to break the chip. And dummy me and dummy him, I brought my white chip back. He didn't tell me to keep it. I gave it back to him, and he gave me the red one, and he did that all the way through, so I never did get my chips. <laughs> the silver one, you know, I kept that one, and the gold one, I kept that one, and my ear chip. But in learning about God, I found that here in this program. And you were going to explain that very, very, very slowly to me. And I want to thank the Portland group and I want to thank all the drunks and all the alcoholics that were around at that time for waiting for me. They had to wait a long time for me to get better. And you know, I was was two years sober or three years sober, I don't remember, maybe six years sober, I don't know, but started the detox centers where we had detox, but they started the other ones there where you go uh, rehab and uh, I had never been in a rehab 
But you know, these people were coming out, my God, they were smart. Oh my God, they knew all about the big book. And they knew all about the 12 and 12. And I said, Jesus, I never learned that until I was two years sober. You know, well, I, some are sicker than others. So I used to say, well, I'm sicker than they are. Because I never heard what they're talking about. You know. So I got right into the program in that area. Because all the, all the people were telling me was to stay sober. And you know, Ernie Thompson was just a little guy about this big. And God, he used to make me mad. And I had him for a sponsor at the group uh, for about three and a half years, and then he died. I was very fortunate to have him. And he wore a little cap, and I thought he was a railroad man. And he wore a little cap, railroad cap, and it come down over his eyes like this. So when I wanted to talk to him, I had to go like this. Because I couldn't see his eyes, you know. And I, if I wanted to talk to him, I want to see your eyes. I don't want your head hanging down here, you know. I might say, well, hey, get a bobby pin and get your hair out of your eyes. i got, I got to see your eyes. So, and you know, he threw zingers. And, God, I couldn't even see what his expression was. And uh, I'll never forget when I picked up my red, my, my blue chip. My three months. A three months chip. Well, we had it for blue then. And uh, I said, Ernie, did you see my chip? <laughs> of course, I thought he'd never seen one before. <laughs> three months of sobriety. And you know what he said to me? Kill him. He said, Three months of sobriety. Hell, he said, You're just dry. Well, wasn't I teed off? What did he mean I was just dry? I had never heard of that before. I'm sober. He said, well, we don't pass blue ribbons out around here. <laughs> I ain't speaking to him ever again in my life. He doesn't know that he's talking to Mrs. Donovan. He didn't give a sh who I was. You're a drunk that's all you are, is a drunk around here. Well, when he spoke at the podium, he pounded on the podium. The door swings both ways. Just be sure it doesn't kick you in the ass on the way in or on the way out. <laughs> and I thought he was talking to me. <laughs> and then Eddie D would get up. You gotta get honest with yourself. It's in sober. And if you're not honest with yourself, you won't stay sober. And you know, I didn't sleep that night if they were on the same pro program. I said, if I drink, they'll kill me. That's the kind of AA I had. They said, step one tells you you're unmanageable. Well, you are until you're sitting in that chair. While you're here, we know what you're doing. I better go. That's the kind of that's the kind of sobriety I was getting. So when I went to the retreat and they started to talk about God being love, I said, Wow, this is pretty good. I like this and nobody was pounding on the podium. Because I was scared. I was still scared. And aren't we still scared? I've had many, many things happen to me during my sobriety. And one of them I'm going to tell you about. Uh, I don't know how long I've got, but it doesn't make any difference to me. <laughs> I'm up on a mountain and who cares? <laughs> my cat does, the home alone. But you know, when I came into this program, uh, before I came into this program, many years ago I had two children. I had a girl and a boy. and. And uh, I separated from my first husband, and, and I couldn't take care of my children. And uh, I just couldn't. I was not a well kid, and I wasn't in, into the booze at that time that much either. I was drinking, but not that much. And so he had to go back to Rumford, and when he went back to Rumford, he found himself a nice woman. And uh, I was just a kid, and uh, so he put my children out for adoption. And I had no say in that, and Peter McDonald, who was the who was a lawyer, said, where were you, Adele, when I went? And I said, 
I didn't know anything about it. A girlfriend of mine come back from Rumford and, and said, did you know your children were adopted? And you know, I also flipped out. And anyway, they went into two different homes, and I'm not here to get any pity. It's okay. It was the way it was supposed to be. I married Jack, and he had children, and I took his children right in, just right to my bosom. They were just my little children. And their ages were near the same. So I had a life with some little children. I said, if I can be good to these little children, somebody's going to be good to mine. And they were both in separate homes, and... And about 35 years ago, my son found me. And we talk about miracles in this program, you know. I was drinking. I was drinking then. I'm only sober 25 years. And uh, he had a family started, two children, and a beautiful wife. And I got to know them. And... There was a lot of dissension in, in the family, and I, I didn't see them too much because Jack wasn't that interested, you know. He was interested. I'm, t- I'm going to say it, and I've told him before, you're a very selfish man because I gave to the children, but you don't care to give to my Rex. And, and you know, he couldn't say anything to that, but that was okay. So after he died, I said, well, Abby, you're gone now. You ain't got nothing to say. I'm going up to see Rex. And up the skull he did I went. And I went up to see my son. And it was all supposed to be. And that's why I'm living in Skowhegan. Now if we don't believe in a higher power that I was drinking at that time and it got worse and worse and worse. You know, that whole thing was all set up for me. You know, God had that in his plan. And if you think you're having a hard time, you're not. You just think God has that in my plan. He has something better for me. I always said, I will never close the door. I'll always be, my kids will always be able to come and knock on the door and I'll be there. My daughter, I met my daughter. She doesn't want to have anything to do with me and it's okay. You know, I got over that. She was adopted into a family that adopted five other children. And so she had a family. And she wasn't too interested in having this new family. But Rex was adopted into a single home with the boy, him. And he, he, in his own little way, within himself, needed family. So his mother and father died, and he looked me up. And then he said to me, what do I call him? I said, you call him your mother and father. They're the ones that reared you. They're the ones that took care of you when you were sick. They're the ones, and so now when he talks to me about his father, he said, my dad, and I know who he's talking about. I know who he's talking about. But isn't it wonderful that there are miracles in this land? And all of those years, I waited. So, you know, you've got to wait and wait and wait. There's no one to say that you've got to hurry. Things will happen to you if they're supposed to happen. And I believe my higher power, I choose to call God, has done that for me. He said, well, Adele, I guess I'm ready. I guess you're ready to go up and meet with your son and be with him. And he is so easygoing. He even softens me. He's so easygoing. Well, Mom, that's okay. We'll do it tomorrow. He's a real procrastinator, but sometimes it's good. Because I want everything like this. And then, you know, I'll ask him to do something for me, and about a week later, I go by whatever I'm doing. I'm, oh my God, he did that. I learned, don't say anything again. Just say it once. I need the piece of board put on over there for me. And don't say it again. And about a week later, you go by, the piece of board's there. Say, wow. I thought he forgot. He didn't forget. He remembers his mom. He's as happy as a clam in in batter. (laughs) He loves his mom. You know, he loves my program. He doesn't know anything about it. But he loves my program. He says, you're beautiful. I just love you, mom. I've been waiting for years to hear that. If you don't think there's a higher power... Believe that I believe. 
And I sat on the edge of my bed in 1970, and I was desperate. But I didn't want to drink anymore. I put my foot on, feet on the edge of the bed, and I was shaking. And you know, you thought that I was having the tremors. And I didn't know what was the matter with me. I was just trembling from head to toe. And I had never done that before. And I know why today, and you know why. I'm talking to a drunk. Because I took a drink. And it soothed me. It quieted me right there. Oh, isn't that nice? Another good two hours. Then I need another one. Then good for an hour. I put my feet on the edge of the bed, and I was from here to, to Paul, and I needed to go to the bathroom, and I couldn't get up. My legs weren't, weren't jiving. They just weren't there. And you know, it was in the middle of the night, or I didn't know what, but it was in the dark. And I didn't know if it was night or day or what, but it was winter time. And I needed to go to the bathroom. But sitting there, I, I, I know where I was. I saw Jesus' face on the wall. And I wouldn't tell anybody this when I came into the program because I was afraid you'd send me to Augusta. Because I wouldn't tell. I didn't dare to tell anybody. And I said, oh, if I could just stop drinking. And he put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, you know what, Adele? I think you've had enough. You know, Dr. Bob and Bill W., many years ago, you know the dates, I don't. I don't know any of that stuff. It's in the big book somewhere, somewhere, I don't know. Oh, you just went to a convention, that's right. <laughs> but that wasn't made 60 years ago. It was after Bill was sober for a while. But the 12 steps were made. And I, I really believe that Dr. Bob and Bill W. got together and they said, you know, there's a girl by the name of Adele Donovan that's going to come into this program in 1970. We've got to have something put together for her because, boy, is she stupid. <laughs> She's a stupid drunk. And if we put these 12 suggested steps together, she's going to have something to live by. And I believe that morning that God put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I got a program from you, Adele. Only if you want it. And you're going to get sober with a bunch of drunks, whether you like it or not. And they're going to teach you to stay sober. So you go there. And that was my answer. And when Cookie came, I really feel that I took step one. I knew nothing about your steps. I knew nothing about anything. And step one told me, they said, we as a group are powerless over alcohol. And then that if we drink, we are, our lives are unmanageable. And I could understand that, but I, I never knew that. And you know, I had to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to have you teach me how to stay sober one day at a time. And then you went on a little bit further and you said, came to believe in a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Step one is nothing but insanity. It's so in depth with anger, frustration, and hate. Uh, the, uh, we had to have step two to get God to get us out of there. I don't want to be insane today. I'm not insane. I'm very sane today. I know what I'm doing. I'm not ashamed of what happened yesterday. And I have forgiven myself for what happened while I was drinking. But as of yesterday, I've done nothing to no one. I've hurt no one. I haven't been mean. I haven't brought up the past only to share. 
So I am not insane today. And this is what I was looking for. And wasn't I pleased that they said, made a decision to turn your life, your will and your life over to the care of God as we understand him or as you understand him. And I thought that was really nice because I didn't have to look at your God. I could just make up my own. I think my own's pretty nice. And my own is Jesus Christ. The God of my own that cares about me so much that he just wraps me in his robes and he says, come Adele, we're going to do some good for somebody. We don't know who, but we're going to do some good for somebody today. And these are my beliefs and I'm only sharing them. I don't think you can find that stuff in the book, so I don't know, maybe you can. You read it, I'll find out. You tell me at the podium. And to turn my will in my life, that was very difficult. But I'm going to tell you something. When I realized after I was sober that my son was in my life, you know, that had to be God. That wasn't anybody else. My Jack and I were married and together for uh, 43 years. We went through thick and thin. He drank and, uh, up until when, uh, when he was so sick uh, three and a half months before he died, he was on the, we call it a kangaroo. He had to bring this little gizmo around because it fed him through here because this was all closed up with, with cancer. God bless him. I mean, I, we got to get very close together because I was able to open, make him open up. Our program taught me how to do that. And, he, and you know, he had a higher power and he used to say, no, he didn't. <laughs> he said, I'm a heathen. I said, I don't give a damn what you are as long as you don't bother me. I didn't know what a heathen was way back when I married him. I said, what are you? He said, I'm a heathen. What's that? Never heard of it before. But you know, he died with a, a love, a love of God. I know that. And God has a little way to interject into somebody that's real sick. And he makes them kind of happy and kind of soft and kind of soothing. I know that because I watched it. He had cancer about seven years, and I was his nurse, and I hated it. I hated cancer. One day I was fixing this little thing here, and I said, and he said, gee, I really don't feel good. And I had to change this thing three times a day, and I used to do it one one time at a time. I'd say, one more time, lovey. Come on, get undressed. One more time, and I had to do it one day, at, one time at a time. One day I said, gee, do you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to give you a shot of whiskey. <laughs> the whiskey was under the desk, you know. I'd like to give you a shot of whiskey. And he said, Jesus, you would kill me. And I said, well, maybe that's the reason. I don't know. <laughs> and we laughed, you know, because he, he knew I was joking. But I was thinking, if I could give him some whiskey, maybe maybe he'd soothe down a little bit, you know. Then he laughed. We both laughed, you know. And we cried together, too. But God gave me all of that, and I understood that. I stood right in the middle of my ceramic hall one day, and I was 16 years sober, and I said, Why are you doing this to me? You know, cursing at God. But I found out that even cursing at God are prayers, because I got his attention. And he said, I said, Why me? And he said, Why not you? You take care of your husband. He has taken care of you for a long time. And we forget that. Say, we forget that as a couple. God has been good to me. I made the decision to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, to be with you people, for you to help me to grow, help me to understand life, help me to be happy. Help me to be free, free of alcohol, free of indecisions, free of hate, free of resentments. I haven't got time today. And someday it will come when you will say, 
people, places, and things cannot get into my life today because I don't have time. I'm too busy doing what's current right here and now, what I'm supposed to do. And you know God loves me. And you know he loves you. He wouldn't have put us all together had there not been a reason. I came up here on the mountain to be with a fellowship, to listen and learn, to share and appreciate my fellow man. I didn't do anything for all of this. It was all given to me by my higher power in you. The same as when a new girl or a new man comes through the door, I must be prepared to pass my telephone number to do what I'm supposed to do because somebody did it for me. We can laugh and we can joke and we can have fun, but you know, I'm very, very serious when it comes down to this program. It's a cause of life and death that's leading it for me. I'm going to close and I want to thank my higher power for being so good to me and making me healthy and I just turned 70. And I told you that when... Oh no, I don't... Uh, you know, I told you that I was 45 years old when I come into this program and I used, and I used to say, and I looked 65. Well, i got to change that now, because I don't know how to change it, but uh, when I came into the program, I looked 105. <laughs> you know, because I look better now than when I came into the program. And I have pictures to show that, you know, with the big bags down under your eyes. and God has given me a bill of health that my doctor gets tired of looking at me. Go home, Adele. You're okay. Thanks. Nothing's wrong. God has given me my health. He's given me my son. He's given me sobriety. He's given me my friends. I never used to have any friends. He's given me you to be with. He's given me this beautiful mountain to be on. I accept anything I have to go to as long as I could be with my friends. And the most wonderful thing that I know and that Jack knows because they ride with me all the time. Come on, God and Jack. We're going. I, can't, I, I hit the, the other seat. They know that they gave me sobriety. The most important thing of my life, this drunk that couldn't talk, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, could hardly walk, they gave me a life beyond everything. And I want to thank you for being my friends. I want to thank you for that love and that understanding that you have for me and that I try to have for you. I have many miracles in my life, and it's all my higher power who has been doing this. And again, I must say, if you don't believe, believe that I believe, because I got enough stuff in me to believe for you. It's just oozing and ready to pour out. And I want to say something because a lot of us live alone. And we get up in the morning and we don't have a partner or anybody around us. And I want to say that if somebody hasn't told you they love you today, let me be the first because I love each and every one of you. And I want to thank you again for listening to me share with you. Thank you, Paul. Again. Thank you.